the clown has been with us for as long as we have been performing. Whether as a part of sacred rituals first created in ancient societies and maintained in certain indigenous communities today, or a part of the far-reaching and multifaceted modern entertainment industry, the clown's function remains remarkably consistent to turn established protocols, societal, political, cultural, logical, linguistic, or otherwise, on their heads, and to provoke a new understanding of and appreciation for the human condition through a celebration of foible and a mockery of power. By examining our lives from nonsensical and chaotic perspectives, clowns throughout time have given us a most vital permission, the license to laugh at ourselves and our beliefs. We can't do without them. In the beginning, the original impulse to clown is connected to some of our earliest and most basic customs. Among the Pueblo tribes of New Mexico that sustain the cultural lineage of our prehistoric ancestors, including the Hopi and the Zuni, clowns have long ridiculed and contradicted the serious ceremonies associated with worship and harvest, marriage and death. Caked in white paint and tattered clothes, sporting mud masks or decorated in wildly contrasting colours, their appearance satirizes the formal requirements of their priestly counterparts, while their behaviors disrupt the ordered procedures of ritual. They gleefully send up solemn rites and dances, engaging in patently ridiculous parodies of service, or indulging in grotesque mock sexual activities. They overeat or consume excrement in the midst of traditional occasion. They invert and garble speech and song, turning revered liturgy into obscene or impenetrable babble. And yet these chaotic and apparently destructive actions are not only permitted, but welcomed and celebrated. By contrasting and criticizing sacrament with the anarchic forces of discord and iconoclasm, Clowns stretch the fabric of human tolerance, bringing resilience to societies and resisting our collective urges toward hierarchy, homogene, however this word is, homogeneity and perfection. Oh, homogeneity and perfection. Through our spiritual aspirations, though our spiritual aspirations may be laudable, they have been known to calcify into dogma. Clowns remind us that we are equal parts devoutness and doltishness, as practiced in falling over, shitting and humping, as we are in prayer and purification. In the fifth dynasty of ancient Egypt, around 2500 BC, this paradoxical relationship between the sacred and the profane was solved in one fell swoop. The priest and the clown became the same person. Described by the pharaoh as a divine spirit to rejoice and delight the heart, the priest clown's purpose, as became the clown's role in countless courtly manifestations throughout history, was to check the absolute authority of the ruler with the unspeakable truth of his fallibility. Records from the kingdoms of India, Persia, China, and Europe all attest to the power given to the clown or fool to say what others dare not. Whether ridiculing a king or ruler or making him laugh at his own willfulness, the clown maintained his function as counterweight to authority and was permitted to do so. Jesters and dwarfs were the lowest of the zoo dynasty entertainers, but by jests and humorous indirect advice, even they could prod their government to reform. Aztec regent Montezuma II said of his gestures, jesters that they frequently pronounced some important truth, while in his praise of folly, Erasmus writes of fools, 
They're the only ones who speak frankly and tell the truth. And what is more praiseworthy than truth? Medieval and Renaissance Europe. These examples suggest that as society slowly shifted their foundations from the spiritual to the political, the impact of clowns expanded to emphasize the critique and ridicule of temporal power. The shifting relationship between the clowns, buffoons, and comic players of medieval Europe with the Catholic Church further developed this theme. Prior to the middle of the 15th century AD, the church-sanctioned Feast of Fools existed in a number of medieval French towns and cities at the turn of the new year, in which the activities of lay people and lower order clergy, improvising parodic versions of sermons and making burlesques of any number of invocations, turned them into de facto clowns for one day a year. In many of these carnivals, the elaborate and specific parody of Christian law, such as the townspeople of Beauvais reenactment of the flight into Egypt on the back of a donkey, speaks to the carefully constructed interplay between popular festivity and spiritual teachings. But as the church became increasingly concerned with its image as a seat of secular as well as religious authority, it saw a overt political implications in this kind of foolery, and those at the top of the Catholic hierarchy grew uneasy. In 1444, the theological faculty at the University of Paris sent a letter to all French bishops decrying the activities of the masquerading miscreants, who, disguised as women, lions, and mummers, performed their dances, sang indecent songs in the choir, ate their greasy food from a corner of the altar near the priest celebrating mass, got out their games of dice and burned a stinking incense made of old shoe leather and ran and hopped about all over the church. From this time on, albeit gradually, fools and clowns, no longer welcome in their own spiritual houses, separated their activities from those of the church. The tension between the jurisdiction of the church as state and the creative license of the now free and unsupervised clowns and players became a running culture sore punctuated by painful incidents, including legal action and the banning of performances. The Renaissance heralded a phenomenal new energy in the arts. As the connection between performers of all stripes and religious or state ceremony eroded, a new identity emerged that shifted the clown's position in society irrevocably, that of the professional artist. In case of the stage, it was the clowns and players of the Commedia dell'arte, an itinerant street theatre that grew into a highly polished indoor entertainment, which conquered the courts of Europe, that made the crucial break with the past when they first formed themselves into a guild and instituted financial contracts with their patrons. No longer were these players integrally connected to the power centres of either church or court. They became free agents, answerable only to themselves, whose livelihood eventually became dependent solely on their public appeal. As a result, the comedia's stock characters began to exercise an unheralded artistic freedom in their efforts to thrill, delight, shock and amaze with their foolery. Notably, thanks to its independence from institutions, the Comedia offered the first ever platform in the Western theatre for female performers, whose wit and craft were celebrated in equal measure to their male counterparts. Comediennes, such as Isabella and Draney, playing the role of Isabella, the enamorata of the company, Gelosi, or Sylvia Roncagli, one of the first female, female comic servants to be known as Colombina became famous pioneers of artistic and economical gender equality on the stage, paving the way for the extraordinary successes of women as actors, managers and stars in post-restoration London and beyond. Freedom for the comedia troops did not come without struggle, however. In certain instances, patrons continued to hold undue influence over their fates as late as 1697. 
The Italian comedians were expelled from Paris for insulting the king's mistress, Madame de Maintenon. Meanwhile, the church continued to hound the players for their blasphemies, obscenities, and license, licentiousness implied by the very existence of female performers. By the tirade, by the tide of history, <laughs> but the tide of history had turned. By the time of the Enlightenment of the 18th century, free theatres and a new breed of patron, the general audience, had been thoroughly established. Inevitably, and as a consequence of the economic necessities that professionalism dictated, competition, profit, market sustainability, the concept of popular entertainment was born. Audiences had to be attracted. And the clown, whose antics had always involved interacting with spectators in the service of laughter, was the star attraction. Some of the Commedia dell'Arte's best-known fools, Tibero Fiorello, Domenico, Domenico and Francini Biancoletti, Colelli, Eva Risto, Gerardi developed comic behavior songs and mimes that became the first of the clown's surefire hits, pieces of clown's business or lazzy that had been audiences rolling, that had audience rolling in their proverbial aisles. Of course, comic foolery had been the clown's stock in trade since time immemorial, but driven by the twin incentives of profit and popularity, these routines reached new heights of sophistication. Acrobatic pratfalls, Tumbling, bawdy tunes, tricks with props, clothing, food, ladders, wisecracks, elaborate set pieces, imitations, mimicry, dance parodies, comic beatings and swordplay, situational gags. Every possible dramatic avenue was explored for its clown potential, giving rise to endless permutations of lazy, many of which we can recognize today in the nonsensical mischief of Mr. Bean or Nola Ray. The content of these sketches, meanwhile, was no longer tied to a specific critique of ceremony or hierarchy. While comedia clowns remained rooted in a comedy of less tension, servants such as Arlecchino, Colombina, or Brighella were continually trying to escape the petty machinations, machinations of their masters, Pantalone or Dottore. The scope of their subject matter expanded considerably, thanks in great part to the presence of women as central figures in the action, the broader eccentricities of human nature, love affairs, sexual obsessions, selfishness, fantasies, became increasingly recognisable targets for their wit. No longer was clowning devoted to expo exposing elevated rights or power-wielding regions. It became democratized, skewering the absurdities of regular folk, people like us, who were now forming the majority of any given audience. Perhaps the only precedent for this kind of comic character study in drama were the classical plays of the Romans, Plautus and Terence and the Greeks, Aristophanes and Menander, along with their English counterparts, Richard Tarleton and Will Kemp, the likes of Fiorello, the Biancolellis and Gerardi became justly famous for their skills. And in case of Domenico Biancolelli, or Dominique, as he was wired, widely known, rich beyond their wildest, wildest dreams. The much-beloved Dominique died with over 100,000 crowns to his name. The connection between art and commerce, laughter and revenue had been forged. Pantomime and the circus. As the Commedia dell'Arte began to suffer from aesthetic stagnation, a final effort by the authorities, by now municipal governing bodies and town constabularies, to limit the activities of scurrilous comedians unprotected by official patronage, ironically paved the way for the next great clown adventure. Banned in some cases from speaking in the theatre, the players presented silent comedies in fairgrounds or unofficial popular venues such as the Theatre de la Foire in Paris. Instead, an evolution that only served to increase the clown's emphasis on physical comedy. Shorn of the trappings of state support, including lavish resources, clowning zeroed in on the basics, slapstick humour rooted in the unresolved love triangle, triangle of 
Arlecchino, now Harlequin, Columbina or Columbine, Columbine, and the newly minted character of Piero, the white faced clown. Other inventive responses to the speaking ban included the birth of comic operata. After all, singing had not been outlawed and the growth of popular puppetry, including a new manifestation, manifestation of Pulsinea, punch as in Punch and Judy. But the lasting consequences of the clown's fairground phase were felt in the birth of two distinctly new forms that took full advantage of the new, new priorities of physical and silent humour, long after the bands that had prompted them were lapsed. The first was pantomime, that gleefully iconoclastic romp that remains a linchpin of the British comic calendar to this day. In its earliest incarnations, before it even earned the name by which it is known, pantomime was primarily an opportunity for great clowns such as John Rich, 1692 to 1761, or Joseph Grimaldi, 1778 to 1837, to ply their comedic trade in the theatres and music halls of Drury Lane or Covent Garden, or in the case of George Fox, 1825 to 1877, on Broadway while nominally, nominally following a narrative that in truth had little relevance to their tomfoolery. The legacy of these com comic spectacles can still be felt in the all singing, all dancing extravaganza of Panto that can be seen in Britain now, although the archetypes of Harlequin Columbine Piero and his coarser replacement Clown, based on Grimaldi's portrayal of the Joey, have long since disappeared. The now, the second new theatrical form that emerged with incredible energy at the end of the 18th century and incorporated the wandering clown who was searching for a new spiritual home in the aftermath of the demise of Commedia dell'arte was to grow from humble beginnings into one of the most spectacularly popular entertainments in history, the circus. Initially a venue for trick riding, the circ those whose circular performing area generated the centrifugal force that allowed riders to stand on their horses' backs, the circus began, began to incorporate comedy in order to offer some relief from the intensity and risk of the serious showmanship on display. Early circus clowns, such as John Ducrow, 1796 to 1834, were often brilliant horsemen capable of extraordinary equestrian feats, such as straddling two steeds as they galloped full pace around the ring. But they came into their own and won the hearts of their audiences when they began inventing comic business that either mimicked and satirized the straight acts or demonstrated a different approach to the horses, dressing them in amusing manner, playing, a, playing out domestic dramas with them and making them effectively into scene partners. The tradition of clowns partnering with animals continues today. Misha Osof feeding baguettes to his doves, for example. The enormous success of these comic interludes soon anchored them to any and every new version of the circus, which underwent a period of explosive growth, simulated in no small part by its export to the Americas. No matter how sensational it acts, no circus was complete without clowns. In some cases, such as the extraordinary Dan Rice, 18. 23 to 1900. The clown was the greatest sensation of all. Rice's own one horse show catapulted him to megastardom until he was adjudged to be better known and more popular than Abraham Lincoln. Perhaps unsurprisingly, he made a bid for the presidential nomination of, of his own. In true style, in true clown style, he failed. Through the medium of the circus, Rice. Frank Oakley or Slivers, Felix Adler, Emmett Kelly, and a host of other clowns achieved similarly elevated status in the United States, beloved for their varying styles of humor. While in Europe, Anatoly Durov, Carl Bagason, George Hall, and Raphael Padilla, Foot It and Chocolate, and the Fratellini brothers were merely some of the clowns who had their circus audiences in 
audiences in stitches during the heyday of the ring. A sudden flourish of brick and mortar vaudeville in the 1800s, known as Music Hall in Britain, variety shows that combined the earthly comedy of the circus with musical fantasia and other oddities, launched a whole new roster of stars such as Dan Leno, Little Titch, and the astonishingly wild Eva Tangway, whose clown-inspired madness anticipated the postmodern art follies of a Django Edwards by a century. By now, the breadth the breadth of creative and comic possibility inherent in the art form was on full display. From the virulent satire of Durov, who skewered banks, the press, and even the mayor of Odessa with the aid of his performing gig, to the whimsy of Kelly, whose morose attempts to steal popcorn from the public epitomized the poetry of suffering, to the flamboyant spectacle of Frank Brown, Flon Bon, King of the Clowns, whose stunts included leaping over 25 Argentinian policemen holding guns and bayonets, to the highbrow stylings of the Fratellinis, whose 40-minute routines at their Medrano Circus, based on the strict hierarchy of white clown Auguste and Contra Auguste, resembled many modernist playlets in the, their sophistication and depth. In the decades before and after the return, the turn of the 20th century, the ascent of these and many other famed clowns to the pinnacle of their respective popular cultures was complete. But a new frontier was about to open that would transform, transform clowning yet again, this time catapulting the reputation of a certain clown into that of a worldwide phenomenon. In his remarkable journey, one can trace the influence of so much that came before and see the source of so much that would follow. The silver screen. Charles Spencer Chaplin, 1889-1987. Earned his comedic stripes as part of Fred Carnot's music hall troupe, or army as they were affectionately known, who preferred the art of the stage silent comedy filled to the brim with slapstick and light and sight gags, once again thumbs, once again dumbs how was a necessity. A response to censorship from municipal authority. Tapping a comic strain that hearkened all the way back to the Commedia dell'arte, Carnot's stories pitted the little guy against the man and delighted in the subversion of modern hierarchies. Prisoners outwitted wardens, petty criminals or bums outran policemen, and the underdog wound up with the girl. Relishing a connection with their popular audiences, these comedians these comedies hinted at the implicit tensions in bourgeois society, seeking to resolve them through the unlikely victory of the working class hero. When Chaplin, whose personal background, including two stints in a workhouse, shifted his career focus <clears throat> to the fledgling film industry in the United States, he combined Carnot's comic sensibility with his own powerful vision of the clown as a universal symbol of artfulness in the face of overwhelming poverty. Like a brilliant Arlecchino battling an endless stream of tyrannical masters, Chaplin's tramp took on an entire system of cops, tops, bosses, industrialists, and exploiters, and one he was the ultimate trickster, an irrepressible fool and spirit of uncontainable mischief, who made a mockery of orderliness and etiquette and ridiculed the capitalist contract between the worker and the world. He also happened to possess an undisputed comic genius, a legendary insistence on perfection and an almost superhuman affinity for every aspect of cinema, acting, directing, writing, editing, producing and even composing his own music. Thanks to the influence and the permanence of film, he became the remains, the clown of all clowns. He became and remains the clown of all clowns, an icon whose impact upon our understanding and experience of comedy is incalculable. Movies such as The Kid, The Gold Rush, City Lights, Modern Times, The Great Dictator are thankfully 
always available to us, realizations of a complete artistic vision. Today, in far-flung corners of the globe, fledgling clowns continue to seek out the works of Chaplin and his brilliant contemporary Buster Keaton for inspiration. So many of the clowns in this book, male and female alike, articulate the debt they feel towards these screen icons. One particularly indelible image captures the young Larry Pisoni, Bill Irwin and Jeff Hoyle with toddler Lorenzo Pisoni in tow, pouring themselves into their vehicle whenever a run of a Keaton film is announced, magnetized by the promise of inspiration from one of the masters. Of course, Chaplin and Keaton were only two of the first in a glorious lineage of screen clowns. Ben Turpin, Laurel and Hardy, Harold Lloyd, W.C. Fields, Abbott and Costello, the Marx Brothers, Harry Langham, the Three Stooges, Lucille Ball, Jacques Tati, Phil Silvers, Peter Sellers, Spike Milligan, Monty Python's Flying Circus, Maura Cam and Wise, Morecambe and Wise, Carol Burnett, Bill Murray, Rowan Atkinson, Jennifer Saunders, Eddie Murphy, Mike Myers, Jim Carrey, Will Farrell, Roberto Bagnini, Benini, Catherine Tate, my favorite, Sasha Baron Cohen, and Ann countless others have explored the central premises of clowning in front of the camera, subverting expectations, behaving outrageously, debunking beliefs, and lampooning sacred cows. Many stand-up comics have tapped into the vulnerability, the foolery, the anarchy of the clown, too. Richard Pryor, Jackie Mums Mabley, Phyllis Diller, Gilda Radner. The madness and mayhem of all of these stars has reached millions, thanks to film, television, and more recently, the internet. But it could be argued that the overwhelming cultural dominance of the screen industry in the 20th century was also in no small part responsible for a diminishing interest in stage spectacle and a marginalization of the circus in general, the ancient art of stage clowning in particular. With priceless comedy available at the local multiplex or beamed into the living room, what need was there to patronize the circus, the variety hall, or the vagabonds on their street corner? As, street, as screen comics became more and more popular, traditional stage clowns seemed out of touch or alien, and audiences, audiences abandoned them. Even the great dynasties of the circus, epitomized by Annie Fret Fretellini, granddaughter of Paul, found their influence to be shrinking, often turning to education as an outlet for their artistry. By the time Chaplin died in 1977, precious few of his screen successors had ever experienced life as a clown in the circus or on the stage. And in and the musical that birthed Chaplin and so many of Hollywood's greatest early clowns was long dead. And yet today, at the time of writing, we are experiencing what could legitimately be described as a renaissance of the stage clown. A positive explosion of clown energy that can be felt from Broadway to Las Vegas, from the streets of St. Petersburg to the theatre schools of the Western world. Who put clowning back on track and dragged it from the outer edges of our comic consciousness where it had dwindled back to the cultural mainstream? For clues, we must examine the influence of the indefatigable theatre pedagogue Jacques Lecoq. 1921 to 1999, Jacques Lecoq. The new wave. Originally an athlete and fascinated by the workings of the body, Lecoq's form, formative experience as a young theatre artist occurred when he worked alongside Italian stage director Giorgio Strela and mask maker Amleto Sartori on a revival of Goldon. Goldoni's classic play, A Servant of Two Masters, for the Piccolo Theatre of Milan, just after the Second World War. By plunging into the lost art of the Commedia dell'arte, the creators of this, of this epic production, which lived on in various renderings for over 50 years, not only breathed new life into the comic masks of the Commedia, but also stoked their own desires to resuscitate the fundamental territories of popular theatre, which had slipped into insignificance in the Hollywood era. 
Lecoq, whose greatest talent was in teaching, opened his own school in Paris for actors and theatre artists and devoted a significant part of his curriculum to these territories, mime, the chorus, melodrama, commedia dell'arte and clown. Over the course of almost five decades of elaboration, Lecoq's dedication to these essential components of our theatrical heritage, never taught as history, always as living, breathing, changing forms, found articulation in the work of his graduates. The founders of Complicité, including Simon McBurney, Ariane Mnuchkin of Le, Le Théâtre du Soleil, an important influence on Gardi Hutter, Stephen Burkhoff and Julie Taymor have not only altered the face of modern theatre, but they each have also brought a band of populism to the stage that has revitalised the experiences of theatre goers worldwide. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of Lecoq students have found their way as teachers in drama schools, universities and actor training programmes where they continue the spirit of his work. When it comes to the particulars of clowning, Lecoq's leg legacy leads us directly to some of the clowns in this book. Avner Eisenberg and René Bazinet were both his students, while the irascible clown maestro Philippe Goulier, the tormentor, once Lecoq's student, then a part of his faculty, and now a lone teacher and one of the world's leading authorities on clown, Philippe Goulier, the tormentor, that's who it is passed on his unique brand of inspiration to Angela de Castro, Peter Shrub and Phil Burgess, who went on to work with Nina Conti. Sacha Baron, Sacha Baron Cohen, the award-willing film star and comedian has stated, I owe my career and the discovery of my inner idiot to Philippe Goulier. Sasha Baron. Lecoq is by no means single handedly responsible for the rude health of clowning on the modern era. Others who worked with Estrella, notably Carlo Mazzone Clemente, founder of Dell Arts International in Northern California, branched out on their own and pursued parallel interests. Additional French theatre predicted practitioners, including Jacques Copeau, a devotee of the Fratellini brothers, whose daughter introduced Lecoq to theatre in the first place, the Etienne de Cru, who taught Peter Shrub and Jeff Hoyle, stimulated a recovery on the art of pantomime that reached its apothesis in the work of Marcel Marceau whose techniques offered a quite different pathway toward physical theatre, comedy and pathos, one that Noel Array and Dimitri willingly followed. The latter witnessed in awe by a young catch of Gamarojobat. Meanwhile, in other parts of the world, clowning has prospered for differing reasons and in different circumstances. The founders of Cirque du Soleil, among the world's largest current employer of clowns, began their creative lives on the streets of Montreal with no formal training in clown, not unlike future Cirque star Michelle Matlock, a classically trained actress, pulled into a world of silliness by her colleague Amy Gordon, who simply insisted they were meant to be clowns. Slava Pulunin, Oleg Popov and Misha Osov continue a rich legacy of Russian clowning, whose star names include the Durov brothers, Karandash, the Russian Charlie Chaplin, Leonid Enkibarov and Yuri Belov, whose tenure as director of clowning at the Moscow School of Circus and Variety Arts, intersects with An Aziz Gual's clown journey. The unique investigations of Richard Pachenko, a Lecoq student who returned to his native Canada to embrace indigenous and tribal clowning rituals in his work, forged the development of a Canadian clown culture that led via the master teachings of Sue Morrison and Jan Henderson to the emergence of Shannon Calcutt, Barcelona, where Django Edwards founded the Nouveau Clown Institute, eventually to direct Anna Delirium, is a city second only to Paris in its clown fertility. And Bill Irwin, 
and David Shiner's creative lives grew out of their respective experiences on the streets and with circuses and the new vaudeville, the movement on two continents, independent of the studio-based explorations taking place in Lecoq's school. Yet Lecoq's vision, so comprehensive and far-reaching, has undoubtedly energized the contemporary clowning while keeping the discipline connected to its roots. The clown has great importance as part of the search for what is laughable and ridiculous in man. The clown has great importance as part of the search for what is laughable and ridiculous in man, Lecoq wrote. It allows one to denounce the recognised order. It allows one to denounce the recognised order. Such basic truths point to the motives behind clowning. Such basic truths point to the motives behind clowning. Motives that Lecoq was philosophically inclined to explore. Motives that Lecoq was philosophically inclined to explore. By exposing and elaborate and celebrating our deepest flaws. By exposing and elaborate and celebrating. <laughs> By exposing and celebrating our deepest flaws. The clown serves to correct our collective tendencies towards hubri and perfectionism, representing instead our innate fallibility and capacity for chaos. By exposing and celebrating our deepest flaws, the clown serves to correct our collective tendencies towards hubri and perfectionism, representing instead our innate fallibility and, and capacity for chaos. Tracing some of the historical lines that connect clowns through the ages helps to illuminate the importance of lineage and succession, apprenticeship and mastery to the discipline. Clown dynasties are common. The Girardis of the Commedia dell'Arte, the Ducros of the early circus, Frank Brown and Father, Du Rove brothers, the Fratellini family, the Marx brothers, Larry Father and Lorenzo son, Pisoni, several hundred years of circus knock. The Bassi generations of foot jugglers and the Larable family are just a few examples of the familial connections among clowns, the ties that bind one generation to the next. Patrons at the early incarnations of Slava Poluni snow, snow show may recall his little son's appearance for the curtain call dressed identically to Slava. Initiation, whether at the hands of a family member or a master teacher who is directly connected to the tree of clowning, remains the primary entryway into the discipline. Trade skills are passed from one to the next through proximity, repetition and endless rehearsal, frequently begun at a young age. Craft is hard won through, through the guidance of an exacting superior. The nature of this kind of apprenticeship was chronicled faithfully in Lorenzo Pisoni's Humor Abuse, in which the author performer recalls and reenacts many of the routines that he learned directly from his father Larry, ranging from simple, simple trips and slaps to elaborate sequences of falling downstairs. More recent lineages have also be been essential to clowns who have had overcome who have had to overcome preconceptions and prejudice in order to fulfill their talents and desires. More recent lineages have also been essential to clowns who have had to overcome preconceptions and prejudice in order to fulfill their talents and desires. Female clown festivals in the 1980s and 1990s, especially in South America, began to create opportunities and showcases for women, combating the covert sexism woven into many cultures that suggests insidiously that women are not as funny as men, and inspiring new generations of clown artists, such as the Argentinians, Christina Marti and her protégé Lila Monti. In 1968, the last large-scale traditional circus in the United States, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey, employed the sensational all-African American basketball on unicycles King Charles Troop. Years later, the circus accepted their first African-American female clown, Bernice Collins, into their clown college, soon to be followed by Denise 
by Denise Payne, both of whom graced the greatest show on earth. The importance of these trailblazing African-American clowns is still felt in the continuing success of the U Universe Soul Circus, where Robert Dunn, also known as Onion Head, who candidly discusses the discrimination he encountered in his youth as a black clown, finally fulfilled his life's passion. But if clowning is a form that is perpetuated through a passing of the torch, how can space emerge for artistic license and creative independence? Can a young clown set out in a different direction from that of his or her teacher? The capacity to express countless distinct perspectives is one of the signature elements of an art form. We should put the emphasis on the rediscovery of our own inner clown, wrote Lecoq. How do clowns play homage and do justice to their lineage while remaining true to themselves and their own idiosyncratic vision, their own inner clown? The conversations that follow attempt that follow attempt humbly to address these and other questions in order to grasp the relationship of modern clowning to its past, its present and its future. Notes. No wonder perhaps that the clown's role as a leveler has become formalized in certain indigenous communities. Many African clowns, such as the Woloso of Dijen of the Bambuti pygmy clowns of the Congo, fulfill the function of peacemakers punct puncturing political tensions through the use of destabilizing gestures, such as lampooning injured parties or appearing nude during hostile situations. And that's it, that's the introduction. So this is the introduction of Clowns in Conversation, second edition by Ezra LeBanc and David Bridell. You can get that from Amazon. It's really brilliant, or I'm sure it will be. I haven't read the rest of it yet, but it's in conversation with Clowns. Um, I don't think you could get much better than this. Absolutely brilliant. And you'll find out all about clowning. Buy it. <laughs>